Good morning, I'm Shruti Jaya Kumar and I'm here today with John McKenna and Professor Martin Elliott. John McKenna is an expert on heart valves and devices and has held numerous senior leadership roles in the cardiovascular device industry. Professor Elliott is a professor of pediatric cardiothoracic surgery at UCL and has led the National Tracheal Service at Great Ormond Street. Thank you both for being here today. Um, the both of you have had an expansive career, um, an impressive career in cardiothoracic surgery spanning several decades. I thought it would be great if we could um, just have a chat about that today. Um, well, we, we've actually known each other for most of the last 40 years, I think. 40 years, so, yes. So, um, I, I did my um, senior training in, in Newcastle um, in adult and adult cardiothoracic surgery first and John kept me on the straight and narrow and um, sometimes slightly off it um, when, when he was starting up as well and uh, um, you know they, uh, they were a period of rapid change in everything we did and uh, I personally was extremely challenged by some of the problems with cardiopulmonary bypass at the time and um, uh, that my, my research was all about making bypass safer and um, that was involved huge amounts of contact with people in the industry uh, amongst whom was John and um, with, without those contacts in that area nothing much would have happened I don't think. Uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't know what was going on, the rate of change was so fast if you didn't have those primary contacts, we wouldn't, I don't think, have asked the right questions. And I, I think the industry stands four square with the perfusionists, with the surgeons, with the anaesthetists in those days. You had a, a very active anaesthetist in Newcastle at that stage who did... When we could get them out of the pub. Though. When you could get them out of the pub. The, uh, they did a great deal of, uh, of what we flew, flew all over the world together, um, lecturing, talking, visiting the plant, talking to the engineers, and, and to get the priming volume down in paediatrics, to get the, uh, the heat exchangers better, to get the oxygenating better, taking out the microemboli, getting better tubing sets, getting tubing sets that were actually joined up and not actually assembled on site. There was a great deal of work to do, and all of that was in the work of, of people like, like Martin and, and, and many people throughout the, the whole, whole world working together. I think that the move from those close relationships with companies where stuff was being developed to corporations with a quarterly return and a bit, lot of VC capital is actually um, not been very good. Uh, and uh, the, the need to have a significant margin every quarter for your investors and for your shareholders has shifted it away from some of the elemental purpose of what the companies were about. When you're accountable to the shareholder and not to the patient, it's not so such a profound relationship to make the rapid development. The, the people you and I, I worked for and you, you dealt with, these people wanted, they, they were often doing it, not totally out of philanthropy, <coughs> but very close to it. They, they, they met you, you could meet people like Don Shelley and, and Edwards, you could meet them and they would no one had been knowledgeable about the products. Now the CEOs are necessarily much higher and further away from that. And they're not always people who are really interested in this, they're businessmen. Well, it's, I think it's generated a real distrust, which is um, important to state that, uh, you know, if the company is writing the press release, if the uh, company is employing a primary author to write the first draft of the paper, and if the data that are being released are not the complete data set, you, you've, you've lost the trust that we used to yeah. have innately for what we're doing. And you see it's, it's much more common with Big Pharma than it is with devices, but those things are fundamentally unacceptable. And um, they sneak through all the time. And I, I've, I feel very aware that that um, creative spirit, that I suppose would now be called a startup, um, what is, is, is a bit missing from our world. It's in the IT side of our world, a lot of startup yes. activity, and it feels really good and very similar to those early days. Um, but for devices, we've become increasingly separate. I don't see that in China. When, you, when I visit China and the Far East, I see that spirit of innovation, and in India too, right slap bang on where it was when we started in the 1970s. The underlying thing is about trust. And... Um, we, as, a, as a doctor, you, 
have to develop that trust with the patient. That's the basis of everything you do, and that requires you to tell the truth. I think the danger with the relationship between industry and innovation and medicine is when that, uh, that trust is broken down by not telling the truth. And therefore, the key element here in all of the research development is as much transparency as possible. But having the raw data held by an honest broker where other people, you or you, can analyse it and say, um, is this person telling the truth? Because only that way will you be able to get that product which works to the market share which it requires. You know, I don't know if you're aware of Michael Porter's value equation, which became very trendy in 2010. It was published in the Harvard Business Review, which applied the basic concept of value. Value equals outcome divided by cost. But said that you, know, you need to rethink it in medicine. Value it should be the only one that matters is to the patient. So therefore, you need the outcome brackets over life divided by cost brackets over life. And those data accumulations are currently very trendy. If our government does go down this route of forcing big data sets to be analysed, but um, that's the only way we're going to be able to answer some of these questions. Nobody should be able to stop reporting at 30 days or three years or five years, and they should all be recording on the same data definitions and data sets. And each paper that we see somehow redefines those, makes them incomparable with other groups of patients. It's, it's just wrong. Well, we, we've seen data being published, actuarial data, and non-actuarial, actual data, and people are not critical enough to look at those two sets of data and, and see that one is we're qualified and one is not with time. And often don't have the skills. I mean, there's a very interesting paper from, um, it was produced in India, that looked at uh, medical students and graduates and faculty of medical schools and the understanding of statistics was about 50 to 55 percent. The rest of the people didn't have a clue. Your score did change the landscape a bit. D do you agree? It did, and uh, I'd say the same for all of the registries that exist where the data are validated. In other words, someone's gone in, are the data complete and are they correct? Mm -hmm. Is the data quality good? But you're only looking at one variable, you know, essentially, which is, or two, you're looking at risk, fact, risk stratification and mortality. But when the mortality is so low, the margins aren't very good. We need to look for more sensitive indicators, and you can only do that by collecting data over a wide range of f features with the same integrity. For industry, there's a vast difference in the return on a transcatheter valve to a surgical valve. Um, and you, I hear from what you're saying that you have some scepticism about that. Well, I, um, I, w I was there at the development of the Melody Valve, and um, it, it, I think it's a fantastic idea. It's what I would, I mean, I would want one if I was a punter. Why are you going to cut my chest up if you can do it through a hole in my groin? Be serious. You know, I, I don't, and if I'm going to, if I'm 80 and I'm going to live another 15 years and I don't really care if I have two valves and I've got a bit of a gradient, that's fine. If I'm 50, if I'm 30, if I'm 20, if I'm 12, I feel differently. And, and I, I don't see that the gatekeeper should be the person making those decisions. It should be multidisciplinary and evidence-based. So perhaps we could talk about some of the highlights of cardiothoracic surgery in the UK over the last um, couple decades. Anything that particularly sticks in either of your minds? Um, uh, I, I think I'd probably go for um, the huge impact of imaging. Um, I mean, if you can go back further and all the things that made my life miserable, but um, bef the imaging just changed everything because, uh, especially in congenital heart disease, you used to have to build up intellectually a 3D construct of the child's heart from your knowledge of morphology, anatomy first, morphology second. But the cardiologists used to take all the echoes in 2D planes, which were projected upside down for their convenience. So you had views of the heart which were from different planes, different angles, and upside down, and then reconstruct that and work out what it was going to be like when you got inside. It, was, it, it took a certain type of mind. A right-sided brain, I think, to do um, that. And uh, you know, it's one of the things that attracted me to it, because I found I'd, I did have that kind of mind, and a strong um, muscle memory about how to do an operation. Uh, but th th then that, that all got better, the snowstorm of 
echocardiography gradually uh, out of it appeared real buildings and um, and then it, you know, the three-dimensional stuff came along, and then the four-dimensional stuff with time added. And then MRI. And, 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 and everything, yeah. And then MRI, which changed everything again, because you could, you could actually see stuff in three dimensions really quite quickly after its onset. And then it became functional. So suddenly you've gone from, what a pretty picture, what, what's going on in that snowstorm, to, uh, oh, that's what it really looks like. Look, can you make that bigger? meaning that you could imagine this heart in a more visible way. And then you can see how it works. You can measure gradients down to millimeters and measure flow, look at patterns of flow. You can recreate operations in your head, which were uh, beforehand something you made up from these tiny jigsaw pieces. And um, that, I would say, has hugely improved the quality of decision making. And it's about to change again as we enter the world of augmented reality and we can fly through hearts and I think we'll be 3D printing the patches to match that child. I don't think we'll be 3D printing hearts for too long, that's pretty expensive and not that helpful, but virtual augmented reality is going to be great fun. Well, well in, in the aortic arch surgery and in descending aortic surgery, the, the companies do actually take in the scan, make a product yep. for that patient with, with the fenestrations in the right place. Uh, for the this, I think, is where this partnership now, this is what I was talking about, the, the edges of the relationship between industry, not entirely corporate, but these service industries for the profession are where we'll see big... It becomes more platform work in, in, as it does That's in exactly the IT yeah. world. And, and, and most of the patients don't know there's actually someone from the company in each of those procedures. Well, uh, yeah, the other thing, I think that's the other thing is that I, I remember interviewing some families that they had absolutely no idea that we talked as a group about them. They, saw, they see the surgeon and they see the cardiologist and they kind of have these concepts that we make all the decisions for them, which is partly an ego trip for both of us, but it's, it's, uh, it is such a team sport. When you bring a patient into one of those decision-making meetings with everyone in the room, I think they're pretty awe-inspired about the thought that goes into their case. And now the technology makes it possible for them to grasp it. If you send a kid home, uh, with, a, uh, with a virtual reality picture of the inside of their heart, they're soon showing their friends what's the matter. It, 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 it changes the ownership of their disease and not makes them a, a, not a victim, but someone who's willing to be... In, in some respects, the companies have embraced this because one of the things that would, has been happening recently is patient days. <clears throat> we invite patients where we're allowed to, where we have permission to. Patient days are a cost for us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we have patients there, so we bring them in, and they meet usually the people who labour away day after day in clean rooms to make the device that they, ha they have internally yeah, yeah, really to them. And, and the effect on the staff is fantastic. The, the effect on the patient, is, we didn't know this existed because it's an anonymous factory somewhere. They don't know what's inside them. Sometimes they don't want to know. <clears throat> What's happening from your point of view from the internet then? Are people becoming more and more... So uh, there is quite, it's quite an interesting um, issue, the internet. I mean, f firstly, 100% of our patients use the families. Because the nice thing about working with children is you're always working with young people and everybody's digitally literate except me. <laughs> and they, um, the in the, everyone who sees us has been on the internet, but they don't declare it. Right, so they go on the internet for two things. One, to look up the disease or the morphology or whatever the problem they've been told is from a letter. And the next thing is they look up you or your team. And they know all about you because it's so easy to find stuff on the electric interweb that they have a, a huge sort of file of stuff. Um, and I, I, we did find a, a patient of ours went to ask all the patients who were in the hospital on a particular day and 100% had done that. Families had done that. It was quite a shock and they never tell you. The second thing is that the kids will often be on there and you start off with Google, which is a quite a good search engine, except that you guys pay to have your advertisements at the top. So the first thing that comes up is John McKenna's new product. <laughs> We're not allowed to advertise to the public actually. But, they, the, but their Google Scholar is second on the list. So they go onto Google Scholar and they type in, you know, chronic lymphoblastic leukemia and they get something to do with that and then the links to the paper, and they follow it quite quickly, and then they find out how to get your CV by clicking on your name on the reference list. 
So it all comes up on Google Scholar, all your publications. So before very long, they know your pattern of work, roughly what you do, whether you are conceived of as knowledgeable, uh, and, and whether you're just bullshitting them in the clinic. And they start to ask, especially parents of children rather than adults talking about their diseases. Very different. The parents come in and say, OK, how many of these have you done? And what are your results? Now, not everyone, obviously. Some people are shit scared of the doctor and they don't want to have that conversation. But the, the most parents are, are really keen. So the internet has changed the relationship to one of partial knowledge but not insight. So they're aware, but not, they don't have any insight. So our job is to give them that insight. And they also start to recognize when people are telling the truth or not a little more carefully. The second phase then is what goes wrong with the internet, which is of course the growth of social media. Yes. So then you have the, 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 the bias talking to the already biased. And your misinformation. And the misinformation is magnificent. There's a lot of bias and prejudice and potential discomfiture and industry and hospitals and charities contributing to it by putting out their own tweets, their own messages on Facebook, pushing that debate away from truth and into, into fake news. And, and there's kind of an intercession group now, which are societies, which is interested parties, who, are, who, are, who have created uh, an intermediary yeah. between the doctor and the, the industry. And, and the industry wants to know who these people are. The doctors want to know who these people are because people are showing up with publications from these people yeah. Yeah. who advertise because they've had a particular procedure or are part of a focus group. Devices are slightly less of a problem, I think, than Big Pharma. I mean, if you go into the United States and you see direct-to-consumer advertising on the television, uh, putting pressure on a GP or family practitioner or even a specialist to give a particular highly expensive monoclonal antibody that's only marginally been proven to work. The market is being distorted by false stories, optimistic stories. So I think your question is really profound. I don't think, it, I think the internet is a fantastic tool for us. It's where the data sit. It's where we can find the source material. The problem is the, is the relationship between news, information and knowledge, which is an indeterminate gradient. And what, what we need to get to the family, or need, as it were, to get to each other, is the knowledge about what is right and what is wrong. And we can't necessarily rely on what's out there. So how do we filter that stuff in order to ensure what it is? Patients group help. You'd think that the charities would help by having, you know, say the British Heart Foundation would put out the right material, but it too has a press centre to push the products that it's funding. And it wants donors yeah. as well, well not, not yeah. physical so, donors, but, money but there donors. are a couple of good, good sites to look at yeah. this. One is healthnewsreview.org, which is an American website which reviews everything that's in the media and says whether it's rubbish or not. And there's one on the um, NHS website called Behind the Headlines, which very, very few people have heard I've of. I've never heard of it. It's on NHS Choices. It's called Behind the Headlines, and everybody should look at it. Every day's headlines are reviewed and the links to the original material and a quick review that tells you whether it's bullshit, basically, or not. And you can find your way through that with relatively little knowledge. And if you want to learn more, the source material is accessible. Right. I, on that, going back to your original question about some of the historical people that, that forged the new path in cardiac surgery, do you think if the internet had existed all those years ago, those people would have been able to have had the complete confidence they got from patients to, I'm not saying they experimented on them, but they certainly tried new procedures, new devices, yeah. I address without, it, uh, without the, the overweening regulatory environment. No, I, don't, I don't think they would be able to do it. I, I addressed this in a Gresham lecture, and I said, uh, could we do now what we did then? Um, you know, going back as far as Gross, first person oh, to yes. tie a PDA, did it when his boss was on holiday. I mean, you know, we'd be in jail if we tried to well, do Well, you can go that. back further, you can go back to John Hunter, who did a, a, an aneurysm behind the, behind the knee. Yeah. I think the knee's still in the Royal College. Because <laughs> um, the guy fell off his carriage, I think, about four years later, and, and he bought his knee. Uh, but he tied it off and was thrown out St. George's. I think yeah. he was expelled. Yes, well, so was Gross. Um, but the, and then they set up the gross chair in Boston, so he's got his name back. But the, you know, the, the whole business of the 
of cross circulation. I mean, yes. can you imagine <laughs> uh, putting that before an ethics committee in the modern era? Two hundred percent mortality. Well, you have potentially, and it's, it's like fetal surgery, which is the three hundred percent mortality. mortality. This baby, the mother, and the next baby. You know, it's all these things that have really struggled to get through in modern environment. The switch and the Norwood are really good examples of whether we would be allowed to do them. Okay. And I, I, I'm, I think we might, but the ethical structure would require a much more longer lead-in time than we allowed in those days, and much more information being given to families, group, either them or their patients' representatives. And today those families would have looked up the internet and said there's been well, they, five they, of these they, operations didn't work, we're not doing it anymore. No, they might stop at that stage and said five worked, please do one for me, that's the problem. So they, 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 there is an optimism bias in what you read and what is published. 70% of what is published in the media is positive about medical stories. So you, 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 they're not going to publish the negative story and, unless there's some scandal. They want to publish the positive story and also it drives the advertising from the people that are associated with that product. Right, I, I, as someone who was in a, in a company who had a, a product problem at one stage many, many years ago, um, you can see just how far that flips in, in, in a day yeah. from positive stories to these guys are, are, are killers. Um, and, and no one sets out in the morning to cause anyone any harm. No one does. No. No. I, I mean, there are a few dictators I could list who might have Yes, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I mean, the, 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 there's a very good piece of work looking at the effect, impact of a press release a positive press release on the stock market price of the company. So if it's a positive press release, this, the price goes up for six months. If it's, an, if it's a press release about a negative paper, the press, stock market price goes down for six months. And it, it happens sort of almost immediately. So you can see why companies would want to control the, the information outlet, which again makes this concept of transparency of data critical. Otherwise you will have withholding of information for economic reasons which cannot be right. So finally, if uh, you both were to look back on your careers, who would be sort of one person that you would say has served as a great inspiration to you? Okay, I'm not. I'm going to let you have one. I'm just give you three. Mike Holden, who was the paediatric cardiac surgeon in Newcastle, who persuaded me I should do that. Um, Mark de Laval, who is the pedi my predecessor at Great Ormond Street, who was obsessed by safety and getting better, and that really stuck with me. And Aldo Castaneda, who was a cardiac surgeon and huge gentleman in Boston, who made it possible to operate on neonates. For me, it'd be Marian Ionescu, who did the pericardial valve, came from Romania in difficult circumstances, and with Mr. Wooler set up a cardiac service. Uh, and also probably someone like Jack Bowcross, who is a name no one knows, but he's the guy who invented or created pyrolytic carbon for heart valves. Probably saved more lives than anybody on the planet, apart from someone who did antibiotics. That'd be it. Um, thank you very much. It was great to hear about your extremely impressive and expansive careers. Um, and I'm sure this will be of great inspiration to many people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shuti. Thank you.